and I'm assuming everyone can hear me. Uh, well, I think we've done enough swimming of the AFM and liquid, so I'm going to switch to talking about AFM in ultra high vacuum and specifically around uh, use the pointer so everyone can see. All right, there we go. Uh, specifically to operating at low temperatures, uh, below 10 degrees Kelvin. Um, this is a really good transition from ambient and uh, liquid work to ultra-high vacuum work, where in ultra-high vacuum you don't have to worry about uh, surface absorbed moisture, uh, gas contamination, etc. You can lower the temperature to freeze out molecular motions, and um, be able to get some of the really high atomic resolution images. Um, historically, when people have done scanning probe at low temperatures, that typically means uh, liquid cryogens or mixed cryogen systems where there's liquid nitrogen used to cool the system down initially and then liquid helium to get those last few degrees to get you close to the four to five Kelvin temperature. Um, that leads into this chart, uh, which shows the supply and demand of liquid helium. And anyone doing cryogenic research can attest to the price of liquid helium continuing to go up, up, and up. Um, oftentimes, for certain research projects, uh, what limits your research is not your ideas or the specific technology, but your budget for liquid helium. Um, and this is where we've come in to try and achieve temperatures close to liquid helium temperatures in the scanning probe microscope uh, by using a closed cycle cryostat system so you can get um, on the order of about 9 Kelvin now, we're of course pushing to go lower and lower every day, on the order of about 9 Kelvin now, um, without using any liquid cryogens, it uses a compressor and a closed cycle system, um, you can turn it on and pretty much run it indefinitely. Uh, some of the big challenges around using a closed cycle cryostat, as people have known from the late 70s, early 80s, uh, the lower you want to go in temperature, the more you have to mitigate uh, vibrations, which is why these, cry these closed cycle cryostat stations uh, work very well for optical experiments or more micro scale probing experiments, but for doing scanning probe microscopy, it's a bit of a challenge because the closed cycle cryostat in <clears throat> induces a fair amount of vibration. So, um, what we have done, we've worked with uh, our partner ARS. Uh, to develop a coupling between their closed cycle cryostat and our scanning probe microscope, which through a ver variety of mechanical as well as eddy current damping schemes, we've been able to mitigate all the vibrations from the cryostat and achieve atomic resolution at temperatures below 10 degrees Kelvin. Uh, this is just an example of the microscope head. I actually have one of these up at our table upstairs if you want to pick it up and hold it. Um, it gives us XY coarse motion of uh, about 5 millimeters and we've got about uh, 8 millimeters in Z so we can take a variety of samples um, into the scanner. If you look at the plots up here. Um, we are looking at um, a spectrum analyzer trace of tone current when um, the STM is engaged and in range of the sample. 
and looking at the FFT uh, analysis of this, we don't see any of the peaks in the lower frequency range that you would expect uh, coming from the cryostat. Uh, and we do the peaks we do see are related to the mechanical resonant frequency of the scanner and its damping system, but we can see they're upwards pretty close to about four kilohertz. Um, this shows a photograph of the system, um, shows an STM image being collected. We're looking at uh, the tunneling current as well as the spectrum analyzer signal and FFT of that. And we can see the signal during operation with the closed cycle cryostat on, um, the various pumps on. Uh, we can see that the FFT spectrum is fairly clean. Um, one of the questions that typically comes up with this type of system is, um, you know, what kind of environmental vibration can the system withstand? Oftentimes, unlike ambient AFMs where you can set on a bench top anywhere and collect uh, data, the UHV systems are typically in larger labs with other vacuum equipment. And to explore this, uh, we set up uh, our system with one of the um, floor thumpers that they use for commercial movie theaters. So when you're sitting in a movie and you experience that low frequency sound where it feels like the seat is shaking, it actually is. They have a solenoid uh, device that is attached to the floor and that's how they transmit the low frequency sound. So. What we did is we set up one of those on the floor next to our microscope and um, did several uh, direct-driven stimulated uh, testing of the system. And uh, we can see for the various excitation frequencies of the floor thumper. This was measured with a calibrated accelerometer that was uh, mounted on the frame of the instrument. Uh, the accelerometer clearly picks up the various driven vibrations from um, the floor thumper, but if you look at the STM image on graphite here, we can see fairly clean atomic resolution. And if we look at the spectrum analyzer signal, we don't see any of the various uh, stimulated excitations um, showing up in the data. So this is kind of a system overview. Uh, the system we call PanScan Freedom because it kind of frees you from liquid cryogens. It is a UHV system, so there's a load lock, transfer arms, all the fun that you get of working in ultra-high vacuum. Um, <clears throat> we've got the, not used to using the mouse as a pointer, it got, um, we've got the um, compressor here that uh, provides the cooling to the cryo head. Um, that is decoupled mechanically with uh, rubber bellows that separates it from the microscope chamber. And then we use uh, various copper braid techniques to attach the cold finger part of the cold head to the scanner as that I showed earlier. Um, and then all of the, the various TSP uh, ion pumps, turbo pumps are all housed underneath. So this system, in terms of being set up, is about the size of the podium that I have in front of me. So for a UHV system, it is reasonably compact. And that, oh, sorry. And that is basically it. That's everything you need to get down to nine Kelvin. Um, the cryo cooler coupling to the scanning probe uses a little bit of helium exchange gas as opposed to liquid helium. The tank that you see there is typically changed every 
three to four months, uh, depending upon um, usage. So nominally, you could plug it in, turn it on, and run for three months, and not have to worry about refilling liquid helium or um, dealing with liquid nitrogen. Uh, this shows uh, an actual uh, photograph of the system, so we can see the cryocooler head. Uh, the cryocooler head cools down to about 4 Kelvin, and that is what delivers um, an ultimate temperature of 9 Kelvin at the tip and sample inside the scanner. And based on the design, both the tip and sample are at the same temperature, so you don't have to worry about the temperature mismatch issues when you're doing um, any of the electrical spectroscopies um, and that. So basically the cryocooler is mounted on an additional frame. This is separated from the chamber. The vacuum chamber is down here. Uh, the rubber bellows provide some uh, mechanical isolation. Um, then we have the heat exchange adapter. The cold head fits in there. And then the helium exchange gas is in this void here. So completely assembled, it looks like this where um, to the first stage of the cryocooler, our radiation or thermal shield is attached um, to the second stage, which is nominally around 4 Kelvin. Uh, we attach the copper braiding to the scanner and ultimately reach uh, 9 Kelvin. Um, let's, see. let's see if these play. So this is a short video of a glass of water on top of the crowd cooler. You can see the um, 2.4 hertz tremor in the glass of water. Um, this is the glass of water on the microscope frame, and you can barely see any coupling of the vibration from the cryocooler into the rest of the microscope. So in terms of cooling down, um, in about eight hours, once you turn it on, you can start making measurements at nine degrees Kelvin. Um, these are pretty typical uh, cooling curves um, for this system. Uh, this is an example of uh, the silicon 7x7 reconstruction that uh, was measured with the closed cycle cryostat on at a sample temperature of 9.2 Kelvin. If we, during the experiment on the next frame, go from the closed cycle cryostat on at the blue dashed line in the image, um, we shut the compressor off and um, turned off the cold cycle cryostat, um, we can see that there's no impact on the imaging. We don't see any dramatic change um, in terms of thermal drift or uh, noise. So here's another example of um, the silicon 7x7 uh, reconstruction at uh, 9.2 Kelvin. Um, this image was uh, this image was a fairly high um, pixel density image. So I believe this was either 1024 by 1024 or 2048 by 2048 uh, pixels. So the image took. Um, multiple hours to collect, and we can s see no evidence of um, thermal drift or um, vibrations from the cryostat in the image. And 
Here's an example of one of the topological insulator samples that is, you know, they're fairly hot topic and are being actively studied. Um, for this bismuth telluride sample, um, it was cleaved inside uh, the chamber. Um, the sample is cleaved around 30 degrees Kelvin. Uh, we were able to um, collect uh, this image at 9.3 Kelvin. Um, we can see some of the underlying um, impurities uh, basically influence and result in these bright spots of um, charge accumulation. And we can also see in the line profile trace around here, the corrugation of the sample is on the order of um, 15 picometers. We don't see any of the noise from the cryostat um, in this trace. So if the cryostat is imparting anything to the data while the system is scanning, um, it's certainly less than a, a picometer or two. Um, here's a larger scale image of the bismuth telluride sample and um, we can see the charge patterns around the buried impurities at a variety of locations. In further clarifying uh, the coupling of the mechanical noise of the cryostat and the environment to the system, uh, we looked at, again, the um, spectrum analyzer uh, mode on our uh, R9 controller. So this is out of range. So this is the STM tip withdrawn from the surface. And uh, we're looking closed cycle cryostat off. Um, the STM is clamped as opposed to being suspended with the isolation system and we can see uh, background noise on the order of 13 femtoamps uh, with the closed cycle cryostat on and the STM suspended. Um, we can see that the background noise is on the order of 18 femtoamps. Um, tip sample fluctuations are very low, so this is basically the feedback, the tip has been pulled just away from the surface and feedback turned off. We can see that um, there's very little drift and uh, Z fluctuations are on the order of three picometers. Um, these are two images taken um, 10 hours after cool down. So this image was collected, an hour transpired, and then this image is collected and we can see that um, our drift is uh, on the order of about two angstroms per hour in XY and uh, 0 .08, 0 0.08 angstroms per hour in Z. Um, I'm gonna skip through a few of these because I know we're way behind schedule. Um, this is looking at um, DIDV measurements. So for DIDV, you park your STM tip at a specific location on the surface, you freeze the feedback loop, and you um, collect a variety of spectra. So we were able to freeze the feedback loop um, for 10 minutes and um, during the 10 minutes the Z drift was as low as 15 picometers um, which shows up as um, about 20 picoamps of noise variation on the series of DIDV measurements. Um, we can also do DIDV mapping. This was a 12-hour spectroscopy volume map where we took full DIDV spectra at each pixel. And um, you can see in the image over 12 hours, you still can recognize the very regular lattice of the silicon 7x7 reconstruction. Almost no drift. Um, this shows um, 
sample that we can switch between the various imaging modes. So we use uh, Q plus tuning fork sensors. So this is a non-contact AFM image um, on the bottom. And then partway through the image, we can change scan size and uh, switch from uh, doing AFM to STM. And these are a variety of um, non-contact uh, AFM images and uh, STM images, uh, silicon 7x7. Um, we've also done, although we can go cold, we can also do variable temperature. That with the closed cycle cryostat, we can use counter heating. So we can operate anywhere from about 9 degrees Kelvin to about 400 degrees Kelvin. Here's a variety of surfaces. This is uh, Indian dope is miscellanide, uh, platinum metal, uh, gold metal, and these were all collected um, with the closed cycle cryostat running, and you can see almost no noise in the various line profiles taken on these surfaces. Um, here's non-contact. AFM image where we look at topography and dissipation, um, as well as the STM image of um, a business selenide sample. Um, each of these were a variety of customers that uh, had specific instrument configurations with, without uh, prep chambers um, and the like. Um, Another group that had our system with a prep chamber, uh, they're looking at uh, oxygen on a silver surface. Um, you can actually do biological samples uh, in UHV, um, assuming that they've been either critical point dried or lyophilized and uh, suspended on a surface. This is uh, lysine. Uh, sample on gold, um, HOPG and silicon carbide, uh, STM and non-contact AFM. Um, this is a titanium selenide sample. And with that, um, I'll go ahead and close down because I know we've got other speakers. So I hope I've shown you that um, we're able to deliver uh, cryogen-free, low-temperature scanning probe microscope. Um, we get excellent resolution in STM and non-contact AFM. The thermal drift is incredibly low, and uh, the instrument is very tolerant to environmental uh, vibration. And with the closed cycle cryostat, it's fairly inexpensive to operate on the order of about a dollar an hour. That includes preventative maintenance and uh, the helium exchange gas prices. Um, so you can pretty much run low temperature experiments indefinitely as opposed to worrying about running out of liquid helium right when you've got the best sample um, imaging in the region of interest. Okay.